live a life. Number 10. In the early 1990s things were heating up in the WRC, and with Japanese giants Toyota, Subaru and Mitsubishi slugging it out for victories, Nissan decided that they needed a challenger. The chosen car was the humble Nissan Pulsar, rules at the time stipulated that Nissan needed to make a road-going version for homologation of the rally car, this was a godsend for car fans, as it led to the birth of the Pulsar GTIR. While Nissan's rally career with the Pulsar floundered and was abandoned after just nine events, the GTIR as a road car was a huge success. Featuring a unique version of Nissan's SR20 DET 2.0 turbo engine, as found in the Silvia and the tried and tested Atisa four-wheel drive, which was first developed in the R32 GTR, it lead to phenomenal performance for the time, and even today a stock GTIR feels properly fast. Of course we have to move on to the looks and let's be honest, this isn't a pretty car, but with its cheese grater bonnet bent, wider track and deep front bumper, it's a bit like a bull terrier, making up for its lack of elegant features with bulging muscles and aggression. This aggression carries over to the driving experience, with the excellent SR20 and sure-footed four-wheel drive handling, they will fight off competition from almost anything in real-world driving conditions. I've had three of these cars and in my view they are the ultimate hot hatch. Number 9. The Honda Integra Type R is the best front-wheel drive car ever to come from Japan, if not the world. Launched in 1995 and with production continuing to 2000, the DC2 Honda Integra Type R was another homologation car and was developed with the brief of being a road-going track car. What you get is a razor-sharp car based on the standard Integra SIR which had its chassis strengthened, engine performance increased, and most importantly had undergone a serious weight loss program, including a 10% weight saving on the windscreen. This all allowed drivers to experience a focused hardcore car in a practical package which was just as happy being flogged to within an inch of its life at a track day as it was doing the weekly shop. The DC2 Type R had just 200 horsepower, but it's delivered by a screaming 1.8 double overhead camshafts tech engine which gives this car its unique character, but even better than the engine is the chassis, the weight reduction and chassis strengthening, makes this car an absolute gem to drive. An interesting fact is that Honda lost money on every DC2 Type R which was sold, showing just how committed they were to making this car the best that it could possibly be. There were a number of improvements introduced in 1998, with these cars becoming known as the 98 spec, and the final run-out models of 2000, designated the Type RX, also had some tweaks, but for me the original 1995-97 version of this car is still the best. Prices are at an all-time low right now in Japan, and this car is going to become more and more sought after, as the number of good examples dwindle, meaning like the others on this list, this is one car you should buy right now. Number 8. This list would never have been complete without mentioning my all-time favorite car the AE86. On paper, the AE86 doesn't sound too exciting, a 1.6 Toyota Corolla from the 1980s, but the reality is this car is very special. The engine may just be 1,600cc, but it is Toyota's revolutionary 4AGE Twincam 16V unit, and while the AE86 came from the dull and dreary Corolla family, this was a car that broke the mold. The AE86 has a front-engine rear-wheel drive configuration and is simply a blast to own. Driving one delivers more in smiles per mile than any other car I know, the 4AGE engine while state-of-the-art at launch in 1983 can at times feel a little underpowered by today's standards, but this only adds to the car's epic character, it's a driver's car which you have to work hard to get the most from, and the combination of that screaming engine with its raspy tone and excellent chassis is like the devil on your shoulder, encouraging you to wring this car's neck. When it comes to styling, like so many other Japanese cars, the AE86 is not exactly from the design houses of Italy, but no matter which body style you go for, two-door Cooper three-door hatch, you get an iconic shape, which as time goes by, seems to just look better and better. The only downside is the AE86's progression towards all-time classic status has meant these cars have changed from cheap and affordable fun cars to expensive garage queens. Prices have increased rapidly in the past two years and are showing no sign of slowing down, and with only so many left in Japan, now is the time to import your AE86 before it's too late. Number 7. Performance Hondas has really divided car fans. 
Very few like them it's either full on love to the point of obsession or complete hatred. I can never understand why, I don't think you can call yourself a car fan if you can't appreciate what Honda achieved with its VTEC engines. In the late 80s and early 90s when forced induction was the order of the day, Honda came to the party and said hey your turbos are cute, but we don't need them, thanks. What they offered instead was not so much an engine, but a masterpiece which revved forever and through variable valve timing wizardry offered power right up to the redline. If you like the sound of this and want a Honda which is going to be an investment, we reckon the EG6 Honda Civic SIR made from 1991 to 1995 is the one to have. The EG6 is an excellent chassis which has over the years proven hugely successful in circuit racing and rallying, even 25 years since its launch this model Civic looks fresh, and its sleek body shape is now iconic in the tuning world, combine this with the all-important VTEC engine, and you have the recipe for an all-time classic. Number 6. When you think of the drift scene, many people would suggest that it was the Corolla AE86 which started it all, and that may well be true, but it was Nissan's S body cars which made it accessible to the masses, and that makes these cars very important car in modern day car culture. The Silvia's body shape changed over the years, but the underpinnings stayed the same, a choice of a 2.0 naturally aspirated SR20DE or 2.0 turbocharged SR20DET engine paired with an excellent and light rear wheel drive chassis. Our choice for this list could really have been any of the S body cars as in years to come, all will achieve classic status in their own right. But the one to buy right now in our view is the Nissan Silvia S13, which was sold between 1988 and 1993. The S13 Silvia looked pretty dated by the time the S14 came along to replace it in 1994, its angular design was showing its age, compared to the more curvaceous design of the S14. As a consequence popularity and prices of this model fell rapidly, and many ended up being drifted and generally bought cheap, then used and abused by Japanese car fans. It wasn't until the early 2000s when people began thinking hey these late 80s and early 90s cars are pretty cool, that the Silvia S13 started to experience a resurgence. Today the S13 looks great, its clean angular lines and low slung stance make it a bona fide classic, combined with that excellent chassis, the superb SR20 and limitless tuning potential, this is one car that should be on every JDM fan's bucket list. Number 5. Many people love the idea of the RX-7, they dream about buying one, but when all is done, they end up going with some lesser car instead. From our experience this is down to fear of the rotary engine. Perceived as complex, troublesome and needing a rebuild every time it's Tuesday, many are reluctant to take the plunge and buy an RX-7. The reality I'm glad to say is very different, an RX-7 is a blast to own, and while rotary engines have a limited rebuild interval, they are for the most part extremely reliable and easy to maintain. Even when the time comes for that all-important rebuild, prices with rotary specialists are pretty reasonable, usually considerably cheaper than a rebuild on a comparable regular four-piston engines. With an excellent rear-wheel drive chassis and that powerhouse rotary engine which seems to rev forever. This car is a real driver's car and is loved in Japan. With production lasting over 10 years, there is an RX-7 for every budget, and with prices set to rise, particularly with rumors that Mazda is to launch a spiritual successor, there has not been a better time to buy one. Number 4. One of my personal all-time favorites is the classic Subaru Impreza WRX STI, launched in 1992 as the Impreza WRX and aimed squarely at the Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution. The Impreza was an instant hit in Japan, shortly after launch of the standard WRX was given to Subaru's Motorsport branch. STI to breathe on and the WRX STI was born, this was as close to a road-going rally car as the Impreza got and is the one to go for. Over the classic Impreza's production run from the year 1992 to 2000, there were six versions and several special editions, including the legendary 22B, each version brought some minor upgrades to the table, but the truth is it doesn't really matter which you choose, even 16 years after the last one rolled off the production line, they feel as sharp and alive today as when new. The handling is a masterclass, and the flat 4 boxer engine is punchy and delivers effortless power, with that all-important Subaru flat 4 rumble. Over the last 12 months we have seen these cars starting to rise in value, as they are beginning to gain modern classic status. 
Prices however are still relatively low, so our advice is get one while you can because they won't stay that way for long. Number 3. My original intention was to put the Mitsubishi Lancer Tommy Mackinnon edition on this list, but with prices now often three times more than the almost identical car on which it is based, the Evo 6, it really is a hard case to make. So I went with the next best thing, and when you pull up beside a Mackinnon owner at the traffic lights, you can be sure you paid a lot less money than they did. The 6 is the last of the classic Lancer evolutions, as beginning with the 7 the Evo began to look a little more restrained and ever so slightly sensible, whereas the 6, which was launched in 1999, was about as subtle as a brick to the face, at the time it looked like a regular Lancer which had entered a bodybuilding competition, it was, and still is an incredibly aggressive looking car. The 2.0 turbo four-wheel drive Evo and its arch nemesis the similarly powered Subaru Impreza STI were what a generation of car fans aspired to in the mid-late 90s, and the 6 came along at the pinnacle of the craze for these cars. I have always been more of a Subaru man, but honestly, the Lancer always felt a little sharper to drive, perhaps due to the fact that no matter which model Evo you decide on, you can be sure it was at the cutting edge of development when new, with features such as active yaw control being offered as far back as 1996. This all means that even today the Evo 6 is a very advanced and properly fast car. Prices haven't really began to take off as yet, but with Mackinnon prices going through the roof, it is only a matter of time, and it is one of those cars about which you will say, why didn't I buy one, when I had the chance? Number 2. The Nissan Skyline GTR is one of the all-time greats, the GTR badge had been retired since the 1970s, so it was always going to take a very special car to bring it back, and the R32 was the chosen one. This was a car built to not only win, but to embarrass its opponents either on track and group air racing or on the streets, earning it the name Godzilla. If you owned one of these when they were new in Japan you knew you had made it, being the first car to use Nissan's legendary RB26 twin-turbo engine, and featuring a state-of-the-art four-wheel drive system, the R32 GTR was almost space-age at the time, and brought the GTR badge back with a bang. Today the R32 GTR is like a time warp back to that golden era of Japanese cars, as a car it showcases all that was good about Japan during the bubble economy. If you haven't had the opportunity, put driving an R32 GTR on the list of things you need to do before you kick the bucket. On the road the car feels like a beast, that RB26 engine even in standard form is a powerhouse, mash the accelerator pedal into the carpet, and the horizon becomes a blur, the handling is sublime, everything is perfectly weighted, and the Atessa four-wheel drive system lets the back end step out just enough to have some fun before reining things back and firing you into the distance with its immense 4WD grip. Some will say that as values have been rapidly rising for this car in the last two years, that the boat has now been missed for those wanting to buy one, but they are wrong. The R32 GTR is perhaps the ultimate modern-day Japanese classic, and prices are set to soar as the years go by making one of these amazing cars an investment which will deliver a return time and time again. Number 1. The fourth-generation Supra is the only car I can think of which fills a unique role in bridging the gap between supercar and regular sports car. When it was first launched in 1993 the JZA80 series Supra was incredibly futuristic looking. I remember as a kid having a poster of this car on my wall and getting a sales brochure from a Toyota showroom which I must have read 100s of times. On one hand the Supra was a hardcore sports car, but it was also an effortless cruiser, mostly thanks to what many believe to be the finest Japanese engine ever made, the 2JZ. This 3.0 engine was available in both NA and of course the all-singing, all-dancing twin-turbo variant. Whilst the NA Supra is a very capable car naturally it's the turbo that everybody wants to own, and with good reason. One thing that always stands out about the Supra is the driving position, it really is perfect, and I've always loved the way the dash curves around the driver, it's a little thing, but it really does add to the experience of this car. When new, due to the high price tag many were bought by more mature owners, and as a result a large percentage are autos, but it really is worth finding a manual and paying the premium as it's a must-have. 26 years old, and yet demand from the US is still expected to be huge, so this is another case of get one, sit back and watch the values rise. These are the cars which I think deserves to be in my top 10 choices. What other cars do you think that I should add in my list? Comment down below.
and don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.